Hi, Miss Lane. I'm here to do a head and neck exam on you today. Are you having any problems? No. Any concerns? Anything you're worried about? No. Have you noticed any hoarseness or problems no. with your hearing? Okay. No. So a patient doesn't seem to have any difficulty with hoarseness um, um, or hearing problems. Now I'm just going to check your head. First, observing it, it's of normal symmetry, shape, um, contour. There's no obvious deformities or um, any bruising, um, no signs of abuse. Um, now I'm just going to feel your scalp. So looking at the scalp, it looks nice and pink, no lesions, no nits, no lice, no ticks. And the hair is soft and of normal uh, texture and distribution. Okay, now I'm going to check your ears first, just looking at them. They are um, anatomically in the correct position. They appear normal shape and contour. Um, there's no lesions on or behind the ear. Um, do you have any pain when I tug on your no. ear at all or right no. there? No. So pulling on the pinna and tragus often causes pain if the patient is um, having uh, an external ear infection. After checking the external ear, um, I can feel over the TMJ joint here, noticing if there's any tenderness or swelling. And then I'd like you to open your jaw wide and then shut it again. Any pain with that? No. No. And I don't feel any crepitus or um, limitation in movement with that. So for the otoscopic exam, for an adult, for any patient, it's good to get used to holding the otoscope in like a pencil, like you're reaching for a pencil, and then you can stabilize against the head as you do the exam in case the patient moves or changes position. So um, for an adult to get the canal straightened out, you pull up and back, and then you need to insert the otoscope while you're observing, and then go in to look. Okay. The ear canal appears clear, and there's no um, cerumen. The tympanic membrane is pink without bulging or retractions. And then I would do the same thing on the other side. With this side, I don't change hands, but now I prop my, my finger against the back of the head, place it in, and then go and look. And then once I'm in, if I see a lot of hair, then I just go a little bit farther. And then if I can't find the tympanic membrane, then I adjust by moving the otoscope this way or that way or pulling a little bit differently, but not so much shoving it in farther. To check for mobility of the tympanic membrane, you can either use an insufflator, which is a tube attached here, and then it has a bulb and you depress it, or as long as you get a good seal when you place this in, then you look and you're observing the tympanic membrane as you ask your patient to um, hold their nose and just blow very gently. And that change in pressure moves the tympanic membrane and you can see about mobility that way. There's two ways to check hearing. One would be um, by finger rub. And uh, what I want you to do is close your eyes. And then your fingers are approximately four inches from the ear. And you rub with one and ask the patient, where do they hear that? And then, where do you hear that? Right side. OK. And then now? Left side. And now? Both. OK. And that's a, a gross uh, evaluation of hearing. The other way to do it would be to stand about two feet away from your patient and whisper something. 49. What do they say? 49. And then do the same on the other side. Um, the reason you have to have the patient's eyes closed is because peripherally they can see movement if their eyes are open. Okay, and then um, if there was any question about their hearing ability, then there's two additional tests you do, which are the Weber and the Renee. 
So you want to use the um, 512 tuning fork. And with this one, the easiest way to get it to go is like that. And you put it in the middle of your patient's head and you ask them, where do you hear that? Let's get it going again. More on the right side, the left side, in the middle. More on the left. Okay. And then um, that's the, the Weber test, so it lateralizes to the left. Um, a normal exam would be in the middle. <laughs> <Really hairy. laughs> Let's, uh, let's try getting it a little. The other way you can get it loud is really get it loud. Mm -hmm. Both sides. So that's even yeah. on both sides. Okay. And then for the Renee test, you have to put it on the mastoid. And so um, if you had not evaluated tenderness in the mastoid prior to this, this would be a time that you could check and see if there's any tenderness back here. And for this, then you. Um, put it on the mastoid, ask the patient if they can hear that. Yes. Tell me when you no longer hear it. Go on. Can you hear it now? Yeah. Okay. So that's a normal finding with air conduction being greater than bone conduction. That can be timed also, and the air condition, conduction should be twice the uh, length of the bone conduction. Okay, so that's Weber and Renee. Um, then we can move on to the nasal exam. So for the nasal exam, the first thing you want to do is just look at the nose. Um, her nose appears symmetric. There's no deformities. There's no erythema. Um, she has no... Um, a little bit of maybe an allergic shiner. Do you have allergies at all? No. Tend to get, no? Okay. Um, any, um, no nasal creasing, and um, then I can check for tenderness by pressing over the maxillary sinuses and the frontal sinuses here. Anything hurt? No. Okay. So, not good to press way up here because the frontal sinuses don't go up that high, but they're right, right around the the brow line right around in here. You can also percuss in that area too. Okay. Um, then to do the internal nasal exam, good idea to change your speculum from what you used in the ear. And then um, similarly to what you did in the ear, you want to um, get this placed before you look into it. So the the nose goes largely straight back. So if the patient just tilts her head just very slightly, and then you can lift up a little bit, and you're not going very far in, just just past the hair in the nose, and you look inside one nares, and then you can look inside the other. And her nasal passages are clear, pink. There's no polyps. No foreign bodies, no lesions, no um, evidence of epistaxis. Everything looks perfectly normal. Okay. So then um, moving down to the mouth and the lips. First, just looking at her lips. <laughs> no lesions, no um, um, sores or any problems. Symmetrical facial features, symmetrical movement of the, of the mouth and the lips. Um, and then I'm going to look inside. For the mouth exam, I want to first check her teeth and just ask her to open, open her mouth. And just going to look at her teeth, upper and lower. And then um, to check for any occlusion, then ask her to bite down on tongue depressor and then on this side. Okay, to see the outside surface of the teeth and the gum line. And the gingiva you can pull out there, um, and on this side, up there. Okay. Then um, open real wide, I'm going to look at the roof of your mouth way up at the top. And then could you lift your tongue up, and I'm going to look under your tongue. Great. Okay. To see the um, inside of the lower and the upper lips, um, you can pull down yourself, or you can just ask the patient to pull their lower lip down as you look and then pull your upper lip up, and then you look there too. Okay, perfect. Yeah, one other thing, I might as well check the posterior pharynx and then look for her 
um, Wharton's and Stenson's ducts. So um, open real wide, and then I can look at the back of the throat. Um, can you stick your tongue out and say ah? Ah. Oh. Okay. As long as I can see, which I can, I don't have to use the tongue depressor on the tongue. If I couldn't see and I needed to, you just press gently, and then again, you still ask the patient to say ah, ah. and you check to be sure that the posterior pharynx and the uvula rises. The um, Stinson's ducts are here on the side, back by the back molars, and then the Wharton's duct is below, underneath the tongue. So lift up, and then you just look at those. Okay. For palpation in the mouth, if you saw something that you were concerned about and um, wanted to feel it, you definitely need to put gloves on for that. Um, for the previous exam, it's important to have um, the use of the tongue depressor and uh, a light. You just put your finger in there, feel along there. You might have to feel um, teeth to see if they're tender. You can also tap them with the uh, tongue depressor. You can feel along the gum line if she's having an abscess. You can feel the glands in the back this way, but always with gloves on. Okay. Moving on to the neck exam, um, just looking at the neck, she's um, symmetric. I don't see any webbing, no scars, no apparent thyroid enlargement. Um, everything looks normal. Um, I can then palpate the parotid gland on each side, which is right here at the jawline. No swelling there. And then um, the salivary glands in the bottom of the mouth this way. Okay. For range of motion, uh, just ask your patient to follow you. I'd like you to look down, look up, look to the right, look to the left and then try to touch your ear to your shoulder on that side and your ear to the shoulder on the other side. Okay, great. Um, just palpating trapezius muscles in the sternocleidomastoid. Any tenderness anywhere? No. Okay, good. Okay, for the thyroid exam, it's sometimes helpful to give your patient a, a glass of water. The thyroid exam starts with inspection of the neck. Anatomically, you want to identify the thyroid cartilage, which has a prominent notch at the top of it. Just below that is the cricoid cartilage, and below that is the thyroid gland. Note any enlargement, asymmetry, or obvious nodules. Then observe the thyroid at rest and with swallowing. Both the thyroid gland, the cricoid, and the thyroid cartilage all rise with swallowing. So you can examine the thyroid from the front or the back. Um, I generally feel from the back after looking at it. So I find my landmarks and then I feel over the isthmus and then the two lobes. It's sometimes helpful to like push a little bit on one side and you can feel the thyroid bulge against your hand, your fingertips on the other side. And then while you're feeling there, you gently you ask the patient to either swallow or take another drink of water and you feel that movement. And that's your thyroid palpation. For lymph nodes, um, you want to start palpating in the back of the head, just at the base of the skull where the occipital nodes are, using your fingertips. Feel here, you kind of circle around a little bit. Think of the lymph nodes as being in a chain, so you can just move your fingers gently from one to the next. This is your post-auricular, so your pre-auricular, these are your tonsillar, submandibular, and then there's a submental just right here in the middle. Right there in the middle. Then um, you've got your anterior cervical chain that comes down here, and your posterior cervical chain here in the back. The supraclavicular nodes right above the clavicle. Nothing, nothing good happens in supraclavicular nodes, so you hope you don't feel any enlargement there. And then lastly, you want to feel for the axillary nodes. So you have to do this on both sides, and I'm thinking this side might be the easiest to see. 
So against skin, if you want to wear gloves, that's fine, or you can just wash your hands afterwards. So you want to relax the patient's arm, and then you have to push up deep into the axilla, and then kind of move your fingers down against the uh, chest wall. And then you flip your, flip your hand around, and you feel against the arm and the humerus. And then you feel inside while you're palpating um, on the outside with your thumb, feeling for any lymph node enlargement against the muscle. And that's one axillary, and then you would do the other side.